I was growing up, uh, nearly every day, my mom would take me and my sisters and pile us into our car, um, and we would head off to the nursing home in which my paternal great-grandmother lived. Um, and I don't know if you are seven years old or if you've ever been seven years old, but like the nursing home is where it's at. Uh, <laughs> I, I would go there and hang out with my great-grandmother and she would tell me all these amazing stories about growing up in Bronx in the 1920s. And it was just a really good time. And not only did I get to hang out with my awesome great-grandma, but I also got to hang out with all of these really cool other old people. Um, and they would give me candy when my mom told them not to. They would tell me all these crazy stories about things that I probably shouldn't have heard as a seven-year-old. But it was, it was just a good time. Um, uh, one day, uh, my mom took us to meet one of the people that she had been getting to know in the nursing home. And she proudly marched me and my sisters into his room. And she said, so full of pride, look, these are my daughters. And the man started laughing, like a lot. Uh, and my mom, confused, was like, oh, what's going on? What's, what's the joke? I, I'm ready to hear it. Um, and the man replied to her, I just can't believe that a white man would marry an N-word. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I was born in New York to the typical, you know, all-American dad. He was a high school football player, cross player, a cool guy, everyone loves him. Um, and he was like an all-American, just Anglo-Saxon guy. Uh, and, then, and then my mom was like the all-American Dominican immigrant. Um, so, it uh, kind of made out. Uh, so, they were so in love and they had four daughters, um, so I'm one of them. <laughs> and uh, growing up, I never actively thought about race. Um, my parents were who they were, me and my sisters were who we were. Um, but on an unconscious level, I wondered like, why do my white friends only eat mashed potatoes and boiled chicken every night and my Dominican friends eat pernil and tostones, but at my house, like, we mix it up. And my, it, it really made my stomach happy, but my brain was a little confused. I was like, why isn't everyone else doing this? Why haven't they heard about, like, this great phenomenon that is, like, mixing up food in your stomach? Um, <laughs> so when I was eight years old, uh, my parents did that thing that I'm sure all of your parents did when you were eight years old, and they were like, we're going on vacation. Um, <laughs> And so they drove us down to uh, Rocky Point, North Carolina, a place with no rocks and no points. Uh, and then they, uh, they were like, trick, we're living here forever. So uh, I, st uh, I still live there. Um, and so the first thing that me and my sisters did when we got to North Carolina was stand in a cotton field. We were, what is that? We'd never seen it except on our bodies. It was, it was pretty crazy. Um, and then the next thing we did was enroll in school. Um, but the school in North Carolina was kind of different from my school in New York. Uh, so instead of asking me to, to like play or what my favorite Pokemon was, uh, these kids would stand up to me and very honestly ask me, what are you? Uh, I was kind of like nervous. Uh, I'd never been with these people. Um, and that made me feel really other. It made me feel different than how I wanted to feel. Um, not like the happiness in my stomach. It was more like a hurting in my heart. Um, so as I got older, these uh, honest, um, very childlike inquiries as to my identity um, kind of turned more malicious. Um, instead of asking what I was, uh, imagine yourself on the playground, ready to take part in like the biggest tetherball tournament of fifth grade. It is, it is a big deal. You've been hurt this season. You jammed your finger. It's like you're ready to make a comeback, OK? Uh, and right before you go on, a kid comes up to you, uh, and they say, you know, God would not mix a mule with an ox. Um, and therefore, your parents being together is an abomination. I mean, in the fifth grade, I didn't have the great biology knowledge that I knew now. Like, that's simple biology. Mules and oxes don't mate for like a lot of reasons. <laughs> but, uh, and my parents are like both like good looking, happy people. So that, that made, they being together makes sense to me. Um, and as I got older, uh, these inquiries into who I was, or who I am, uh, kind of got more aggressive. Uh, so I've had people tell me if I didn't have an identity to identify with, like a singular identity to be 
uh, I would die. Um, so what does that mean with me being alive, you know? Uh, so, uh, yeah. So a couple of years ago, uh, I was visiting with my, you know, all-American, German, Anglo-Saxon grandmother uh, in New York. Uh, uh, and sh we were eating, like, broccoli casserole or something, you know, the typical Anglo-Saxon American dinner. Uh, and she was just talking. She loves to talk. And she was like, oh, yeah, my dad... Juan Carillo, I was like, hold up, Grandma, what's going on? <laughs> what are you? What am I? What is anything? Um, and this really sparked um, a conversation about something that's been going on in my family for longer than I've been alive. Um, so in the early 1900s, my uh, great-grandfather, Juan Carillo, immigrated to the United States from Mexico. Um, and this was years after the Mexican-American War. Um, and when he got to America, he was like, oh my gosh, I just met the most amazing German, Anglo-Saxon, American woman in New York. So they promptly fell in love. Um, and they had probably a bunch of kids. Birth control wasn't great then. Um, <laughs> and so uh, my grandmother really grew up in like, this great multicultural household. But um, when she went out into the world with her um, siblings, and they spoke German, Spanish, and English, um, every time they spoke Spanish, uh, they were chastised, um, and my grandmother received like a lot of racial slurs directed at her. People would call her spicks and try to beat her up. Um, so it was not a good time for her. Um, so she would go back home and be like, parents, what do I do? How do I make people love me? Um, and they said, OK, Anna, just stop speaking Spanish. Um, and so they would do that, and then they'd probably give her her little German pint of beer so she could drink it with her little kid lunch. Um, <laughs> and I realized then that, firstly, even though I super duper love my grandmother, she's great, I don't want to be like her. Um, I don't want to give up a part of who I am, a part of what makes me comfortable to be me, to, in order to make other people less angry with me. Um, and I also realized I do not know anything about being biracial. I don't, I don't know history. Um, so this prompted me to do more research. Um, so uh, I found that in the year 2000, this was the first year that US citizens were able to mark more than one um, race on their census, which is like 100 years too late for my family. Uh, and, I, and I also found that between the year 2000 and um, the year 2010, the population of biracial people or multiracial people in the United States grew by 50%, which is a big percent, you guys. Um, and then. Right now, there are about 22 million people of multiracial heritage living in the United States. And that's like a big number of people to be feeling other and like different when you have so many people that are like you. Um, so this further prompted me uh, to start working on a way for people to express who they are. Um, I didn't want people to feel other as I had. So um, right now, I'm working on starting a zine online because this is 2015, uh, and it's called Check Other Mag. Um, and this is going to be a place for people who fall in between the lines, like uh, the people in the gray, to share their experience and to feel more connected with the people that we live around. Um, and I don't want people to feel other like I did. I want people to feel com connected and comfortable. I want people to understand that they're not different. Or they are different, but they are the future. So. Um, uh, what they are is great. And when you have a diamond, I'm not a gem cutter, but I think that like, if the diamond has more facets, it's just more beautiful and more complex. Uh, so thank you. <laughs>